أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا من سيئات أعمالنا من يحد لله فهو المحتد ومن يدلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم وفرقان المجيد بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحد وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساعلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا وقال أيضا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وأحسن الحدي حد محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار اللهم فصل وسلم وزد وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل أصحابه وأحل بيته أجمعين رضوان الله عليهم إلى يوم الدين سبحان الله وبحمده عدد خلقه ورضا نفسه وزينة عرشه وميداد كلماته أما بعد We begin with the praise and glorification of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the amount of his creation until he is pleased by the weight of his throne and the grandeur of his words subhana rabbi al-a'la Surely all praise and gratitude is due to Allah who has united us under kalimatul haqq La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam We praise him and we seek his forgiveness and we testify and we state that there is no God or deity worthy of being worshipped but Allah and that the Prophet Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his worshipping slave and final messenger as to what follows Alhamdulillah Allah Azza wa Jal has given us the opportunity once again to convene in his house on this blessed day of Jum'ah so that we can join with one another in seeking the reward and the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now as it pertains to Jum'ah, there is a surah in the Qur'an that we know we are recommended to recite on this day particularly. And that is Surah Al-Kahf. And when we recite Surah Al-Kahf, we find that there are four stories in it. The first, making mention of Ashabul Kahf, or Ahlul Kahf. The people of the cave. The second, Ar Rajulain, or Al Jannatain, the two men or the story of the two gardens. The third, Musa wa Khidr, Prophet Musa alayhi salatu salam, and the wise man Khidr, and lastly, Dhul Qarnain, the king. Unfortunately, we cannot cover each and every one of them today because attempting to do so would not give each example its due diligence. So we will cover one instead. The mention that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes of the two individuals and the two gardens. And we will try to extract three simple lessons from it. Of course, there are more, but given the time constraint, we will try to learn three things from this account. And I've elected to share with first myself and to remind you the story of these two men because what happened between them the conversation one of the contents in the conversation that they had with one another is very similar to the situation that we see happening in our homes in our workplace in our schools and in our masajid so what happens in surah al-kahf who are these two men what is the situation that Allah Azza wa Jal describes with them? Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala tells us in the surah, "Wadrib lahum mathalan rajulayn ja'alna li ahadihima jannatayn min a'nab min a'nab wa hafafnahuma bi nakhl wa ja'alna baynahuma zar'a." 
and present to them, Ya Muhammad, the example of two men. We granted to one of them two gardens of grapevines, and we bordered those gardens on all sides with palm trees, and placed between the two gardens a field of crops. And the other individual, the second of the two men, was not as wealthy. He was not as adequate in terms of wealth and children. And the surah goes on, That each of these two gardens, they produced their fruits and they were never short in any aspect. And we caused in between the gardens a river to burst forth. Now we must remember that this is a time when taps didn't exist. So you couldn't just go and turn a pipe and have water. There was no such thing as a garden hose. So if you had a garden or a plantation, you needed to have at the same time an irrigation system in order to take care of those crops. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you a natural irrigation system such as a river, then alhamdulillah, your life is set. The problems are solved. There's no reason to worry. But despite being so fortunate, what does he do? He said to the other man, whilst he was speaking with him in conversation, A bold, brash and outlandish statement. He says, I am greater than you in wealth and I am mightier than you in followers. And we find it even today that when an individual or when someone is speaking nonsensical things, statements that don't have any virtue, at times they don't know when to stop. So they keep on going. They dig their own graves, so to speak. And what does he continue to say? He says, وَمَا أَذُنُّ السَّاعَةَ قَائِمَةً وَلَا إِرُّدِدْتُ إِلَىٰ رَبِّي لَعَجِدَنَّ خَيْرًا مِنْهَا مُنْقَلَبَ So he continues in this conversation and he's doing this dhulm, this injustice and this oppression to himself. And he says that I do not think that this, as he's walking in the garden, that this will perish abada, ever. That I don't think this is going to go anywhere. And he keeps going. He says... And I do not think that the hour, Yawmul Qiyamah, will occur. And even if I should be brought back, he says, if I should be brought back to Allah, not when, but if, then the reward that I will find with Allah there is better than that which I have here. And this is the first lesson that comes from this part of the surah. <laughs> That superlative statement, Ana akthar mink, I am greater than you. And we see this statement around us all the time in many different ways and forms. And I don't mention anyone in specific or any organization in specific or any task in specific, but we find it that one individual says to the other that I have a better job than you. I drive a better car than you do. I am more educated than you. I am better than you in X, Y, and Z. And it happens amongst the younger brothers and sisters as well. I'm more popular than you because I have more friends on Facebook and more followers on Instagram. And it's become commonplace. And the sad reality is that we find it happening in all of the masajid. Where a brother or a sister says to another, that I know more Qur'an than you do. Or I have studied more hadith than you do. Or my shaykh is more educated than yours is. Or my masjid is bigger than yours. And we find it in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we need to question ourselves. Are we cognizant of the fact that every single ni'mah down to the breath that you are taking right now is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, much less the house and the job and the car and the degree. It comes from Allah. There is nothing that we have earned by ourselves. 
But this braggadociousness, it's ingrained in our minds at this point. So at the drop of a hat, we rush to belittle the next person so that we can boast about ourselves. Even though we know the hadith found in Kitabul Iman of Sahih Muslim, where Abdullah ibn Mas'ud narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us that he who has in his heart the weight of a mustard seed of pride shall not enter into Jannah. And one of those who was listening when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said this, said, Ya Rasulullah, surely a person would want their clothes to be elegant and fine. And they would want their shoes to be elegant and fine. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responded, Verily, Allah is graceful and He loves grace. But pride is this dislike for the truth and disdain for other people. And this pride that we have, my brothers and my sisters, in these small things, they need, it needs to go. We need to let go of that ostentatiousness, that pretentiousness that's holding us down, that's tying us down to the dunya. Because it engulfs us in running after things that matter here. And we're losing sight of the things that will matter in the akhirah, the things that will matter in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal. In 20 or 30 years time, if Allah should give us life to see it, we'll look at the same things that we have now. The same phone and the same car. And we will say, A'udhu Billah. We seek refuge in Allah from these things. How did I ever manage to live with this kind of phone? How did I ever manage to drive that kind of car? The grandchildren and the great-grandchildren who will be alive at that time with the will of Allah will laugh at the things that we covet today. The iPhone 10 that we have will be referred to as an antique. It will be parked up in a museum somewhere and the people of that time will visit that museum and they will say, look at how those indigenous people used to live. Look at how little they had. They're comparable to cavemen. Because in this life, there will always be something better. That's why there is that thing called the next best thing. And nobody knows what it is, but it keeps on coming. But when we orient our minds towards the Akhirah, my brothers and my sisters, let us ask ourselves. Because things begin to change. What can possibly be better than the Jannah and the reward of Allah Azza wa Jal? And by the same token, what can strike more fear into our hearts than the Jahannam and the wrath of Allah Azza wa Jal? And that's the curse of the dunya. When we run behind things that only matter here. Because this dunya is like a rat race. And I've heard this example before and it's quite a clever one. So I will convey it to each and every one of you. This dunya is like a rat race where we're running along and we find a piece of cheese. But when we get to this piece, we smell a better one. So we leave this one and we run to that one. And when we get to that one, we smell an even better one. So we leave that one and run to the next one and so on and so forth. So even if you win the rat race, congratulations, my brothers and my sisters, you're still a rat. Al-Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah, he mentions in a statement of advice, where he says, Ya ayyuh al-shabab, i'malu lil akhirah. O young men and women, work for the akhirah. And he continues this statement by saying, that in my life, I have found that when an individual works for the Akhirah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala benefits him with the dunya as well. And he continues to say, but I have never found in my life that when an individual runs after the dunya, that he has any reward to reap from the Akhirah. And what makes working in this dunya? What makes working for the Akhirah whilst we are here easy? our surroundings. And this brings me to the next lesson we learn from this part of the surah. After this rich individual said all of these ridiculous things, the poor man, his companion then told him, that have you disbelieved in the one who created you from dirt? 
thumma min nutfah, and then from a single droplet, thumma sawaka rajula, and from that droplet fashioned you into a man. And he told him, Lakinahu Allahu Rabbi, Wala ushriku bi Rabbi ahada. But as for me, he is Allah, one, and I refuse to associate any partners with my Lord. And the advice that he gives him is one that is very profound. One that each and every one of us should take and ingrain into our personalities. He tells him, وَلَوْلَا إِذْ دَقَلْتَ جَنَّتَكَ كُلْتَ مَا شَاءَ اللَّهِ لَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ That why when you entered into your garden didn't you say what Allah willed has occurred. And there is no power except the power of Allah. And by our surroundings, the aspect that we need to pay close attention to is our friends. Those whom we choose to have around us to give our companionship to. Because it is of paramount importance that all of us, male or female, young or old, rich or poor, we pay close attention to these individuals. Because our friends can quite literally make us or break us. Because we spend time with them, be it at work or school, after work, after school, on the weekends, what have you. But what is the result of the time that we spent with them? When we sit and we talk to them and we spend time with them, do we walk away from that gathering a better Muslim? Do we walk away with incrementally more Iman than when we joined them? Do we walk away even a more well-rounded individual than when we join them? And this includes the conversations and the friends that we have that exist in our phones as well, my brothers and my sisters. Because if we're having these conversations and they're not doing us any good, then they are doing us harm. If we're having these conversations and we're discussing the lives of other people in a negative manner, and we receive, even if the situation is such that we are just receiving it. If we read it, if we enjoy it, if we say nothing against it, then unfortunately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold us equally accountable for it. At the same time, we cannot expect to gain from our companions and not be able to give others through our companionship. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reminds us in a hadith, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه That neither of you could be true believers until you love for your brother that which you love for yourself. So if our brothers and our sisters are doing something that is earning them the displeasure of Allah, it is our duty to at least call it to their attention. Because we cannot simply want to have just good friends. We need to improve ourselves as well so that anyone enjoining our friendship will be in good company. And the Prophet wasallam tells us the benefits, the merits of good company and the retraction of bad company where he says a good friend and a bad friend is much like one who sells perfume, musk and the blacksmith. If you spend time with the good friend, you will leave his company and he would have given you a gift of perfume. Or you may have bought some perfume from him. But at the very least, you leave his company with a sweet fragrance. But in the bad company, like that of the blacksmith, your clothes might end up burnt. You might be covered in soot. But at the very least, you leave his company breathing the putrid air from the furnace, as is found in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim. And one of the habits that we have gotten into, my brothers and my, si my sisters, a very serious one with regards to our friends, is that we've convinced ourselves that constant agreement is a condition of friendship. When in actuality, dignified disagreement is necessary in a friendship. So we, if we find that we have a friend that's constantly, you know, saying yes and nodding to the things that we're doing and they're not telling us of the things that we're doing wrong, we need to reevaluate our friendship with that person. And this is not coming from my pocket, my brothers and my sisters. A hadith found in Sunan Abu Dawood states that anyone who criticizes you 
cares about your friendship. And anyone who makes little or makes light of your faults cares nothing about you. My brothers and my sisters, we need to be cognizant of those whom we keep as our companions. Otherwise, we will be like the individual mentioned in Surah Furqan, where he was exclaiming, Ya waylata laytani lam attaqidh fulalan khalila. That woe unto me, I wish I hadn't taken such and such a person to be my friend. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst the righteous individuals whom others want to befriend. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enjoin us with those who keep us in constant remembrance of him. اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما بركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العامين إنك حميد مجيد My brothers and my sisters, the third point, but definitely not the last one, that we can learn from the story of these two men in Surah Al-Kahf is about our expectations from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially as it pertains to us challenging the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we recall that the richer of the two men said, Ma adunnu an tabida hadihi abada, that I don't believe that these gardens will ever perish. So what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cause to happen? Wa uhitu bi thamarihi fa asbaha yuqallibu kaffayhi ala ma anfaqa fiha wa hiya khawiya. وَهِيَ خَاوِيَةٌ عَلَىٰ أُرُوشِهَا وَيَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِي لَمْ أُشْرِكْ بِرَبِّي أَحَدًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused the gardens to be encompassed by ruin. And he performed this action of wringing his hands. Now it's not so common nowadays, but you ask the elders the significance of this action of wringing your hands as it is very, very significant. It is a sign of an individual in deep distress with no aid, who is at the deepest as it can go. And what does he say? Ya laytani, woe unto me. I wish I hadn't associated partners with my Lord Allah. And we find these examples throughout Islamic history and throughout our modern history as well. One such person, a king, that lived at the time of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam by the name of Nimrud issued a challenge to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's quite humiliating the end that he met. He wanted to put an end to Allah because he didn't want Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam to receive any more revelation and to cause a diversion amongst the people. So what he did, he told his army and he had a vast army he told them, gather and bring your arrows and bows and point it to the sky. And on my command, you will shoot at the sky because today we are going to defeat Allah. We are going to challenge God. And the soldiers were shooting these arrows one after the other after the other. And Nimrud, nothing is happening. So he says, you call yourself Allah. You call yourself God. I'm here. And I'm ready for you. I'm ready to defeat you today. If Allah wanted, Allah could have caused a mountain to come upon them and crush them. But the hikmah of Allah is such that he caused tiny mosquitoes, a swarm of mosquitoes to overtake his army. So now they're occupied with the mosquitoes. The soldiers are running from here to there. Nimrud is running from here to there, swatting away mosquitoes. And through the mercy of Allah, this king, this tyrant, he inhales a mosquito. And by the power of Allah, this mosquito survives and it's living in one of the sinuses in his head. Now, every time the mosquito is hungry, it needs to take some blood. And every time the mosquito is restless, it makes that buzzing sound that we are all familiar with. And in order to get that mosquito to stop, Nimrud has to whack himself on the head. So he's going around constantly, you know, whacking himself. And the trick here is 
that every time he hits himself, he has to hit himself a bit harder the next time to get the mosquito to stop. So this is going on for some days and some nights and he gets tired. So he calls his soldier. He says, come, bring like a stick or a club, something resembling a baseball bat and stand by my side. And every time I instruct you, whack me on the head because this mosquito is bothering me. And day and night, that was the soldier's post. And the soldier keeps hitting him every time he asks. Now, he's taking a lot of blows to the head. And that's seriously not good for your health. Until there came a time when the soldier was tired of this posting. So he says, you know what? I'm going to kill this mosquito once and for all. One hit. So Nimru told him, hit me, the mosquito's bothering me. And the soldier gave him one good whack. And that was the end of the mosquito and that was the end of Nimrud. Why was his end so humiliating? Simply because he thought he was a Jabbar and he thought that he was a match for Al-Jabbar. So he challenged Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the examples are many. We find in Surah Qasas around the 75th ayah, the lesson of Qarun, where he walked in the streets full of pomp, with this pompous attitude, showing everyone the wealth that he accumulated. He was so wealthy that it took several strong men to carry the keys to his palace. And he said, everything I have is from my knowledge and from my ability. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused the earth to swallow him and his wealth whole. You want a more modern day example? It exists. Take the RMS Titanic. In excess of a thousand people lost their lives. A tragedy? Yes, it was. But what happened at that time? What was the challenge made to Allah Azza wa Jal? And this is in the archives, you can find it. An individual who was in charge of the construction of the ship, the engineering, he was asked in an interview about the build quality, about the sturdiness. And he said in that interview that this ship, this vessel is unsinkable. That not even God could sink this ship if he wanted to. What did Allah cause to happen? The sea engulfed the ship whole. It sits at the bottom of the Atlantic. And we learn from this about our expectations from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Habibuna Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us in Hadith Qudsi that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I am as my servant thinks of me. We need to expect only the best from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to expect that when we are in need of sustenance, Allah is the sustainer and He will provide for us. We need to expect that when we are going through the hardship, that Allah is al-basir, that He sees everything and He knows what the situation is and that He will provide a way out. And we need to understand that Allah is aware of all that we do all and all that we say. So we need to adjust our actions and our intentions accordingly. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us people of greater understanding. May Allah place in our hearts the iman necessary to only expect the best from Him. May Allah place iman in the hearts of our friends so that they will be better Muslims and we will follow suit in their companionship as well. May Allah eradicate every ounce of pride that is in our hearts and enable us to live our lives with humility and piety like Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I ask Allah to grant all of those in our community who are sick relief from their illnesses. I ask Allah on behalf of our Muslim brothers and sisters who are facing oppression around the world to grant them freedom from their oppressors. I ask Allah to forgive us and to forgive all of those who have departed before us and Muslims around the globe and grant us all a place in Jannatul Firdaus. Allahumma adina al-haqqa haqqa wa rizukna tiba'a wa adina al-batila batila wa rizukna jtinaba ibadullah rahimani wa rahimakumullah inna Allah ya'muru bil-adli wal-ihsan wa ita idhi al-qurba wa yanha anil fahshai wal munkari wal bagh ya'idhukum la'allakum tadhakkaroon udhkuru Allah yadhkurkum wa aduhu yastajib lakum wa la dhikru Allah ta'ala أعلى وأجل وأتم وأهم وأكبر وأقيم الصلاة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر 
إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر